All right. Are we ready to get started? Yes. Um, thank you for joining us today. So we see a lot. And I have Shiloh. Thank you so much. Uh, for anybody who's new to our platform, I just want to say welcome. Um, welcome to Women of the Leader, Women Economic Empowerment Platform. Uh, for any of you who's not new to the organization and our platform, I just want to say welcome back and thank you. Um, couple housekeeping, if you like, um, you can always do a speaker view. Um, so when the program started, so when you have a speaker view, then you'll be able to see the panel that is speaking today. Um, so I'm going to share a couple screen today. There you go. Okay. Hello. Happy Women's Equality Day. Or I should say Unhappy Equality Day, right? Because we still have a lot of work to do. Um, today's session is a seat at the table in conjunction with uh, Women Equality Day by put together by Women of Toledo and we have a program partner today too that you're going to hear from. Um, today is our power hour session 11.30 to 1. So I just want to go over a couple program agenda for today. If you can see on your screen, um, it will last about 90 minutes. Uh, the first 10 minutes, um, we have a quick presentation to give you back the history of the women's suffrage movement to, to have the conversation for you to be able to see now and then. And also, I'm so excited that through our research, we encounter the music from the suffrage movement. So the music that you were listening is a background song for the suffrage Elizabeth Knight, 1958. I believe it recorded in 1958, but it was way before that. So if you ever want that it, a record of music, let me know. I'd be happy to drop the link in the power uh, in our chat room because it's really exciting to hear all the music and really listen to the lyrics. Um, we'll get started about 11.45, uh, which is about right now. We are right on time, so hopefully we'll start on time and we can end the session on time today. Um, for anybody who is still new to Women of Toledo, uh, my name is Nina Corder. As mentioned, I also have Christina al -Sayed, who is our test team for our program. She usually handle a lot of conversation in the chat room. And if you have any questions, you can hop over and send her a private message. And of course, also today, uh, we are grateful to have one of our responsive advocacy task force moderating this session that in our pattern. So she's a motivational speaker, social justice advocate, an author, attorney, and she's a founder and CEO of Rice Advocate Program. Um, so we are excited to have her here today. Uh, a little bit about Women of Toledo. Um, we provide a lot of programs and services that tackle issue critical to women economic empowerment and women's issue in the workplace, marketplace, community, and family. Um, so we stand on our diversity and inclusion to educate, engage, and empower and youth to keep moving forward. Um, don't be afraid to lean in with our organization. We are not a membership organization, so you are welcome to join any of our community program and community circle on a monthly basis. So check it out our website for the schedule. And of course, we welcome volunteer interns to help. Since we are nonprofit, we can always use help, especially we are very research-based organization. Uh, we love facts and figures, so we always look for any interns that are interested in doing a lot of research on women's issue. And as a nonprofit, we welcome support and partner. And of course, with, our, with partner, we definitely want to welcome our partner today, the Matriot. And I believe Shiloh, you're in the audience today? I am, I'm here. Nina, will I be able to share my screen or not? I'm Hello, happy to go can't either way. Hear you. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, fantastic. I wanted to ask whether or not I can share my screen, Nina. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, and thank you for allowing the Matriots to be a partner with Women in Toledo. I see several familiar faces here, Diana and Sharon and Katie and Yolanda, that we've had a chance to be in your uh, in your rooms before. So this is very exciting. Thanks. I am, uh, as Nina indicated, both sort of excited and devastated that, that, the, that we're marking the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment today. Uh, a great moment for women, but uh, barely a start, and there's so much left to do. So the reason that the Matriots exists, our mission is to elect more women to Ohio office who will create an economy in which women can thrive and prosper, and we do that into the auspices of being a political action committee. So essentially, uh, we raise money through contributions and then have an endorsement process that we give to women across the state who are running from anything for school board all the way up to Ohio Supreme Court. So I just wanted to share a little bit about um, why we exist and how it relates to today and encourage you to get to know us. And I know I just have five minutes, so let me see if I can share the screen now and I'll dive right in. Here is probably what more of your speakers will get to today in different forms, but here are the actual research reasons about why women lead differently and the outcomes that happen for all of society, right? They work harder to serve constituents. They are less likely to be there for a platform and more likely to be there to do the work of their district. They bring home more money to their district. Um, and they're more collaborative with the opposite party. And that's important as the Matriots uh, began to form in 2017. We are a nonpartisan PAC, and that sets us apart from lots of other kinds of PACs that you may be aware of. Uh, we are interested in using a values lens to assess both the women who are running for office and to attract people who would be our contributors. So the question, uh, after we answered why women lead differently and, and set a bold goal to be at 50% by 2028, just nine short years away, um, we next need to understand, well, if we wanna get to 50%, what does Ohio look like today? No one had actually done that research. And so we have commissioned this research about all of the women in office in Ohio, 17,412 elected positions across the state incredible, uh, both in terms of the number of opportunities for us to put women in there and for the significant numbers of women that it means that we yet need to recruit and encourage to run for office. Because we're sitting today at 29%. These are numbers that are current as of 1231, 2018. So this doesn't yet show what happened in the 2018 election, but we will update these numbers this fall and we look very forward to seeing these numbers uh, rise. Um, I'm going to offer this uh, piece of research to you in the chat because it is so important to understanding our role in the world, and I know that you'll want to spend a little bit more time with it, uh, so I'll do that before I wrap up. The other thing that I'll just share here before I uh, run out of my five minutes is a brief look at our 2020 slate. We have 63 women that we are endorsing from across the state. They're in 37 communities, here they are, and they just represent every kind of diversity that you can think of. Um, race, age, region, rural, urban, these are the women that we are giving our all to, both in terms of time and talent and certainly our treasure as a pack to try to get these 63 women elected on November 3rd. So, uh, you know, voting is going to be weird this year, but do everything you can to get your ballot in, please. <laughs> and I'll just put a few items in the chat uh, so that you can get to know us and you can request more information from me if you like. Thank you, Nina. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Well, thank you for partnering with us. We always appreciate whenever you come around. Thank you. All right. So let's get started, 11.50. Looks like we are good on time. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our program today is a part of our Women Economic Empowerment that is planned by our Responsive Advocacy Task Force. Um, so recent year, last fall, we established a special Responsive Advocacy Task Force to help lead, support, and assist our community, especially our female community, about our current political, economic, and social issue. Um, this is our new initiative, so I welcome you to check it out the website, join and be a part of it and see how you can give your time, talent, 
pressure and influence to support with all the advocacy. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just pass over the space to our moderator, Diana Patton, to take it away. Thank, Thank you so much. I so appreciate this. And this is a, a wonderful time for us all to get together. You know, I don't know about you all, but when I was watching the slides, I saw the transition, you know, to being more a diverse amount of people, you know, as we all know that this Women's uh, Equality Day really started off pretty white. And then we moved into a more diverse group of people um, and um, in terms of sexual orientation as uh, abilities, disabilities and so forth. So, so grateful for where we are. We still have work to do, but I know that we are all um, here to, to put a roll up our sleeves and do all that work. So, all right, let's get started. Thank you so much, Nina. And thank you so much to the uh, women of Toledo, Shiloh from the Matriarchs. Uh, thank you. And we have a distinguished group of panelists here today. So I want to just give you a little insight into them as we see uh, Shiloh in the chat, putting forth the individuals who are a part of the, um, the, the slate of women who are being up for election or, or running for office this year. So let's get started. We have the amazing Candace Harrison. I want to we I have to read these bios because they're amazing and I just wanted to share a little bit about them. Candace Harrison is the external communications manager for the Toledo Public Schools, owner of Synergy Management LLC and a native a native of Toledo. She's a proud graduate of Central Catholic, go Irish. She received her uh, bachelor's degree at UT at University of Toledo, her master's degree at Spring Arbor University, University, and she recently served as the Director of Communications at the Toledo Museum of Art and Senior Communications Manager for the Toledo Zoo. Candace is the recipient of a 20 Under 40 Leadership Award and Top Community Voice from the United Way of Greater Toledo. She has many activities that she's involved with, including the University of Toledo Alumni Association, Press Club of Toledo, the African American Leadership Council, where she's done so much work in education, income, and health for African Americans. She is a member of the uh, Rotary Club, Toledo chapter, uh, Toledo chapter of the Lynx, Delta Sigma Theta, Toledo chapter of Jack and Jill. She's married and she has two kids, one of which I know very well. Candace, thank you so much for joining us. Next, we have Toledo Councilwoman Katie Moli. She is, she grew up in the Close Park neighborhood. She is a proud spouse to the uh, Phil, a lieutenant on the Toledo Fire uh, Rescue Department. She currently serves as the at-large councilwoman for the Toledo Councilwoman, uh, chair of the Ethics Review Committee, vice chair of the Zoning, Planning, Budget Oversight Committee, and Finance Debt, Debt Oversight. That's a lot. She is a proud graduate, another Go Irish Central Catholic. She went to Miami University where she um, got an honors in European University at St. Petersburg, Russia, where she earned a master's in Russian studies. So maybe she can you know, talk to us in Russian. Um, after five years of um, service, she actually volunteered with the US Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur and then went on to become a CPA. Um, she most recently worked at GBQ, formerly known as Weber Clark, as a senior audit accountant. She served as a chair of the Epic Toledo. She's also served as a treasurer and board member of the Family House and a Most Blessed Sacrament Parish Assistant Girl Scout Troop. She is also a recipient of the 20 Under 40 Leadership Award. Welcome, Kate, uh, Katie, to this wonderful distinguished panel. Uh, we have also Dr. Sharon Barnes. She's the Associate Professor Chairwoman of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies in the College of Arts and Letters at the University of Toledo, where she teaches courses in gender in American society, global women's issues, and a number of courses in departments, uh, sexualities, studies, concentration. Her current research interests include women in the wilderness, women's spirituality, feminist through and culture, and the 20th century and American women poets with a special emphasis on women of color, lesbians, and the working class woman. In addition to her work at the university, she is the founder, get this, of the Uppity Woman's Poetry Workshop. Now we need to know a little bit more about that and is a longtime member of Toledo's Back the Night Collective. Thank you so much, 
Sharon, for that. You all are in for a treat as we start to talk a little bit about, first, I think one of the things we want to start with, and you know, Candace, I'll just go ahead and start with you since I started talking about your bio first. Have you seen, how have you seen women progress in your field and career, communications, marketing, and, and the like? So what, what do you see in your field for women? Uh, thank you, Diana, and thank you to we lost audio on him. That's me. I'm moving around too much. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying thank you to Women of Toledo. Thank you to you. And um, as far as the industry goes that I'm a part of, which is communications and public relations, um, I am not uh, a part of marketing, which many people always think that marketing and communication are synonymous, but they're not. Um, but in our industry, actually, it's a very female-led industry, communications and public relations. Um, historically, you know, at the beginning of the industry, because at first I really didn't know, and I had to kind of look to PRSA to see what was our influence years ago. And in the 1900s, when the industry started, it didn't seem to be very many women. But by the 60s, it started to increase, and now um, it's over 70% women in the communications industry. But the issue that I see is that it is incredibly um, lack of, it's a big lack of diversity. It is definitely mainly white females that serve in the industry along with white males. So not only are there um, challenges at the C-suite level because most people in communications and PR, if they're not in the C-suite themselves, they report usually direct to or in some form or fashion to whoever the leadership is in an organization just because of what your responsibilities are. You're responsible for the reputation of an organization. So um, that is where I see challenges and where we can have growth is um, the responsibility and the appreciation of people, especially women that serve in these roles. Thank you so much for that, Candace. I appreciate that. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, people do confuse that. Well, and a lot of times, you know, depending on the organization, they do put them together as a department. But the, their function, out, they, they work together, but they're very different in what their responsibilities are. Got you. Thank you so much for that. Katie, how about you in this, in your field? Hey, thank you. Um, again, I'm so grateful to be here. And uh, I guess I'll start with the political field. So when the 19th amendment was passed it was passed by an all-male congress you know and 50 years later there was still only one female senator and 10 female representatives that number has increased but we're still we still have a lot of work to do so in congress there's only about 100 um, and one women uh, 25 in the senate um, and then locally there's about 27 female member or female mayors of the you know the hundred largest cities in America, um, and then you can see in state legislators that, um, throughout the country it's about twenty eight point nine percent. So there's still a lot of work to do. And then I guess I'd also just comment um, on the CPA world, which is I guess my other field of expertise. Um, it's even it's a little it's a little more dark. Um, while women are fifty percent of the CPA pool in the U.S only 19% are firm shareholders or actually leading firms. Um, when you go to CFOs in the business industry, that gets even worse where it's only 9%. So there's a lot of work to be done um, in, that, in those fields. Uh, we clearly get into the, um, in the CPA world, we get into the industry, but we don't rise. You see that and why does that happen? And so there's a lot of challenges there. And then in the political landscape, you know, I think um, we need more examples of women running. And that's why I'm so grateful for what the Matriots are doing. So other women can see themselves and know that they can, they can do it. You know, they're, as opposed to just saying, you know, well, I'm just a blank. They know that that does make them good enough and qualified enough to step into that public service light. Thank you so much for that. That's helpful because I, you know, the CPA world, I know that is a, a world my niece is in. And I know that she speaks of that, but you know, getting that higher, that, that seat at the table in those higher level um, uh, parts of, of, it, of the company is so very, very important and is lagging. So thank you for sharing that. Dr. Barnes, Sharon, she said we can call her Sharon. And 
So go ahead and let us know a little bit about your field. So it depends on if we talk about my field as education or women's studies. Because um, if, we, if we talk about it as women's studies, then it's a pretty women dominated uh, enterprise. Education, of course, is a lot more complicated and a much longer story. Women's studies just came about really in the late 1960s. Um, but in education, women really had to fight for the right to be educated, um, like a lot of other communities. Um, and before I go farther down that path, though, I also want to say thank you uh, to the Matriots and to Nina and Women of Toledo and Diana Yu and all the other panelists. And I specifically want to express some gratitude and um, accolades to, to you for the diversity of your enterprise. Um, Nina, I've long admired your capacity to be an organizer and bring people together. So it's, it's just wonderful and an honor to be a part of, of that, a small part. So thank you for that. And also uh, to echo um, Shiloh's point about the uh, suffrage, um, and it's kind of relevant to where I'm headed with this education part uh, to say that uh, in some research that we, we've done in terms of global women's influence, uh, there's a statistic kicked around and I can't give you the source, but uh, they say that a tipping point for influence is around 25%. So um, uh, Councilwoman Moline, your point about where we are and, and um, uh, where we need to be, uh, it seems that uh, nationally and globally in some ways, we are right on the cusp of um, the play, that tipping point where we will start to see our influence magnified. Uh, so I just want to uh, make that point. And then um, I've heard that this is becoming a little bit um, uh, like, uh, just a gesture, but for me, it's a bit more than just a gesture. I also want to recognize the indigenous people um, as part of that diversity comment. Um, my colleague here at the University of Toledo, Dr. Barbara Mann, has done amazing work on um, Iroquois women, Iroquois culture, but also uh, she has a book called The Land of the Three Miamis. And as you know, we're sitting here on the Maumee uh, River, so want to make sure we acknowledge that diversity as well in our debt especially in terms of women's activism, because the, the Iroquois um, Confederacy, women had, it's a matriarchal culture. They were incredibly powerful. People would, uh, lots of people would argue and believe that um, our government is mo uh, modeled on theirs uh, with three branches, et cetera. And women uh, decided who the uh, chiefs were, who the, uh, if it, or not, we went to war, women controlled their own property. Uh, so we owe a lot of debt of gratitude, especially the early feminists were very aware of uh, Iroquois culture. So long way away from my topic, which, you know, I guess as a professor, I, I get I get called out on that a lot. <laughs> so, so in just in terms of education, we had to fight for our right to have ac access to education. Uh, then it was separate and our, our curriculum was separate. So we had those home ec type to topics. I don't know, depending on your vintage here on the call, you may remember uh, trying to get into classes that girls weren't supposed to be in. Um, and, and specifically in my field of higher ed, uh, by 1978, we were surpassing men in terms of associate's degrees. Uh, by 82, uh, we were surpassing men in bachelor's degrees. By 87, in master's degrees. And by 2006, uh, women were surpassing men in terms of um, PhDs. Um, all the caveats about women of color and um, uh, difficulties of access and difficulties of climbing that ladder are still in place. It has not translated into full professorships. Women are still only 32%. The argument is women aren't in the pipeline. That's false. Uh, and so I would echo, uh, and then I'm going to shut up, uh, uh, Councilwoman Moline, that uh, um, the higher, the phrase is the fewer, the higher. So the, or the higher, the fewer, the higher you go, the fewer women, uh, fewer, the less diversity you see. And that is still true in my field, unfortunately, uh, as it is in the other field. So um, I did throw a, a report in the chat. If you're specifically interested in higher ed, there's, there's stats there. Okay. Thank you Stop so me. much for that. First of all, I know really, honestly, you know, acknowledging our history is so very important. 
right? And the land that we are on. I think it's so very important for all of us to know our history and to where we go so we can know how the future, it's just so, so very important. So thank you for that. Thank you for the point about tipping point of influence. That's what we all gotta keep in our mind, looking at our fields, understand, everybody needs to understand your field that you are in and where we as women sit and understand that 25% factor. How can we get to that 25% factor? And we gotta get full professorship on the PhD. So thank you so much for that. So let's get into some more meat here. Can you share your success story? What journey have you been on? And what challenges and obstacles have you faced along the way, right? So we got to get into the meat because we, we had to see where we're at. So Councilwoman Moline, tell us a little bit about how you have seen this happen for you. Sure, thank you. So, you know, since I was young, I've always been competitive, I guess. And, you know, in fact, when you mentioned us going to um, both uh, Candace and I going to Central Catholic, that was actually one of my deciding factors was that I wanted to compete with boys because I knew in the future I would have to compete with men, you know, the rest of my life, you know, in order to succeed. And so um, it was, I guess I would say my success story really begins with education. You know, I thought, I always thought that was my path to, you know, really get where I wanted to go to go to Europe, you know, and then I'd like, as you mentioned, you know, I was lucky enough to work for Congresswoman Captor, you know, for a number of years in her Toledo office that really got me involved in the political world but then i you know i diverged my path and i became a cpa which i think um really uh enhanced my my skill set right uh, what i noticed you know you asked about obstacles is when you're younger and especially a female i think you're not taken seriously you know you can have the educational background but you really are questioned you know you're really valued on your appearances or what you can do for others, you know, in certain respects. And um, that's what, that was one of the major challenges I saw, especially working in the political field at a young age. And so then I, so I said, well, what can I do to really give myself more credibility or more, you know, more enhance my, my success? And, you know, becoming a CPA, I think really did do that. I mean, it gave me a great career. It gave me great experiences. Um, it still does. <laughs> um, and it gave me so many opportunities um, to be in really great professional networks. You know, I was able, as you mentioned, you know, become chair of Epic Toledo, which is a program of the Chamber of Commerce. And then with that, I got to sit on the board of the chamber. And that was eye opening in and of itself, you know, and, but that also gave me some leadership um, skills and examples to, you know, give myself the confidence to step into this role as a Toledo City Councilwoman, you know, that having those experiences and those ability, you know, those um, those opportunities. Um, other obstacles, you know, getting, you know, just thinking about is, I know in the CPA world, there's, you know, there's this idea of, and you see it even in politics too, of like a boys club, you know, I, I, kind, I kind of alluded to it where you, you need to see yourself in these positions of power um, but sometimes it's really hard to break into that because you can see the clicks that form and you might be the only woman. And so how do you get into the, the golf night or the, you know, the poker night or these, you know, these men that are in your same profession are bonding and really connecting, but you only have that opportunity at work. So you're in the serious mode and you're, you know, and you don't have that same, that same opportunity. So, um, that's always been a challenge, but the way, you know, I've, I've tried to uh, overcome it is find other common ground and other ways that, you know, you can connect and, and, and be taken seriously. I think, I think education and finding what you're really excellent at and becoming the best at it really proves yourself. It gives you a voice. It gives you legitimacy. Um, and it really does help you become successful. And that's what I've tried to do in my life <laughs> so far. I think I'm still at the, at the very beginning part of my journey, but um, those, those have been, that's been what I faced in my career. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's so helpful. I feel like it's finding that common ground, right? And trying to navigate from there. Thank you for finding that voice. Yes. Um, Candace, you want to share a little bit about how you have traveled this journey, obstacles you face. So my journey was a little bit, um, it, it had a lot of routes to it. 
Um, <laughs> when I started at University of Toledo, I knew that I wanted to work in the communications field, but actually at that time, I had positioned myself to be in broadcast journalism. That's where I started. And during that time, my junior year at UT, I got pregnant with my son. And my son, who is now 21, yes, you do the math, <laughs> um, that kind of changed my path. And so actually, um, at the time, it was more about taking care of a, a child as a single mother than it was my goals at that time. And so my goal became being a mom and a good mom. And so I went into an industry unbeknownst to me that it would come full circle, I started working here for TPS as a substitute teacher. And it was a way to work full time. It was a way to um, like get some professional experience. I was still very young. I was 23 years old. And um, that's what I did. I did that for a couple of years. And back then, that's when they used to have something called a building sub where you could just work in one building and you would just sub every time opportunity presented itself so you could just work at one school and so I was in one school for a, a good portion of the time so then um, as my son got older and I got a little bit more confident in myself in the workforce I started to try to get into my field and I also during the ship during my undergraduate when I had my son I knew broadcasting wasn't going to be for me because I wasn't going to have the ability to move around. That's something that you definitely have to have a willingness to do in that industry. So I switched over to public relations, which was something that I didn't really know what it was. And then when I switched to that major, I realized this is perfect for me. Is this like the perfect career? So I, that's where more of the obstacles in my career started because the nature of public relations in this area, and I'm assuming everywhere else, is breaking into the industry. It's very much you. you it's very much about you and your body of work that helps you move along in the industry. So, people, because you're responsible for reputation, you're responsible for media relations. It's a very forward-facing position, you have to go out and build relationships with people. Organizations need to be able to trust you to do that. So even though I had worked, you know, for Ohio State and I, I had had several jobs not in communications, it was very difficult to get in. So humility is how I started my PR journey. I took a position that was several levels behind where I had gotten to in my career um, at a hospital in Monroe. And there, I became a communications coordinator. And I worked under someone who um, just was wonderful to me. She was gracious. She enjoyed my story. It was much like her. She also, you know, had children while she was in college. And she kind of took me under her wing and helped me a lot. Um, Jackie, I wish, you know, she was here to hear me give her praise because I do. Because she was very much a senior level person who just, like I said, gave me a lot of um, insight, a lot of experience, and she put me on a lot of high level projects, even in a lower level position. And I literally went from a communications coordinator to a communications director from that position here. And it was director of healthcare marketing at University of Toledo Medical Center. And from there, the story went on. I did some work here for TPS again in another capacity. And then I left and went to the Toledo Zoo where I was responsible for um, all of our forward-facing communications, working with our agency to do creative and things like that. And then uh, led a department at the museum. And then now I'm leading all of our external communications here at TPS. So success for me, like now, I'm still working at it because now I'm like into, okay, now I want to do my own thing in addition to what I'm doing. I'm never, ever content with just like right here. I'm always moving. And I think that's part of how I was raised, raised by my grandmother, who was very much, you know, very active in the community and very much somebody who didn't like to sit down either. And so I'm still working at success, but I'm very proud. You know, like I said, my son's 21. I've since married and I feel right now that I'm very comfortable where I am in my life. But again, I'm always never just content. So I'm always striving for the next thing. Well, thank you so much for that, Candace. So what I'm hearing is first of all, you've persevered. But where for you sure. are to where sure. you are now, that takes a lot of work and I thank you for that. And also, you know, breaking in the industry, there's what I heard was trust. Trust is big. 
establish that trust and humility. You use that word humility and mentors, mentors are important. Thank you for that. I have so many, and I've been so grateful because I have some are on this Zoom right now, mentors, champions, and that's, you know, I also, I have to add that to the journey, relationships that I build along the way. Um, I've never, I've always made sure that I didn't burn any bridges and kept relationships at the forefront because that's also helped me along the journey. Thank you so much. Great nugget. I would love to... Yes. I'd love to comment on the yes. humility part. I think there's something so important there. You know, um, in my journey too, you know, I, I worked for Congressman Capter and when I decided to, I wanted to be a CPA, similar to you, I had to really take a step back and a step down to get into that industry, you know, and there was a lot of humility that comes with that, you know, starting at a very basic level to be able to rise up in that, in that area. And so I think sometimes, um, uh, you reach a certain age and you think, oh, I, I don't want to start over. I don't want to, you know, I, 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 I'm here and maybe I should just stick it out and see if, you know, I can eventually be happy. But I think what you're saying, Candice, is a testament to really changing, you know, to really going for it because you can succeed and you can, you can um, start over or you can find a different area as long as you have that humility to know that you will succeed and you will rise in there. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I just had to comment on that because I thought that was so um, sometimes you feel unique, but you're really not. <laughs> we're, we're all doing this together. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the add-on. Wonderful. Dr. Barnes. I would chime in too on the, um, Ms. Harrison, your point about not burning bridges because I think, and, and maybe age as well. I think when I was younger, I was much quicker to write people off and define them as having nothing to contribute and um, maybe being more verbally, vocally dismissive than I am today. I'm a little more like, okay, I work with this person. I need to figure out how to work with this person. Um, sometimes it feels like it's really not possible, but uh, you know on, on the day to day that if you have to do that, you're gonna do it. So I think, um, good advice uh, about that. In terms of the journey, my, my educational journey, I think um, might surprise those of you who know me to, to know that I would say the big ab obstacle for me was uh, social class. And um, <clears throat> not necessarily, I mean, I think I have an interesting relationship to class. My, my, by the time I came around, I have a huge uh, family. By the time I came around, I would say financially, my family was middle class, but um, culturally, we, we're, we're working class people. We have a, a, a way of approaching the world. And so getting myself ready for college involved my best friend who helped me figure out how to, my, my older sister figured it out on her own. Uh, my brothers were all athletes and got scholarships. And so I, I, my best friend helped me figure out how to apply for colleges. And um, when I was get finishing my BA, my one of my mentors uh, helped me apply to grad school, and um, you know her husband worked at UT, so I applied here and got an assistantship here. Um, I'm probably one of the very few faculty members here whose PhD is also from here, um, and very happy to be here. Um, so it, I think that when they talk about the hidden injuries of class, you know, not knowing how to do things, not knowing what questions to ask to make things happen, I would say uh, was a big part. When I first got here, uh, all the male teaching assistants in the, in the English department uh, at the time um, had already played racquetball with our advisor and they were chatting him up and I was like, did I miss a meeting? You know, like I, I, it just, I had no idea how that happened. And um, so I started to see how that old boys network really worked. Not that I didn't know from undergrad, because I did. Uh, but then the, the TA or the guy who ran the program at the time uh, kept using the example of little Susie. You know, how, how little Susie had pretty handwriting, but didn't think well, you know. And I, I think at the time I didn't have the language and uh, capacity to see that kind of blatant sexism for what it was. But even the more old boy network part, I think I just 
uh, I wasn't able to define it and, and maybe offer a critique at that time. Um, luckily, met some good professors here who helped me. And not that I didn't have them in undergrad, because I, I did. I went to a Catholic college where the nuns were the radical feminists. Mm -hmm. So got to give credit to those mentors as well. You so yeah, I would say class. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Dr. Barnes. And I think I'll have to kind of piggyback on that question, because I think everybody's face kind of went like, when that comment came up, and this is something we all deal with, are those little innuendos that come up with women and how you handle that. Uh, you know, basically, we see that in politics today, you know, where people are saying, oh, she's too emotional, or she's, you know, the angry black woman and so forth. And, um, you know, or, you know, hey, little girl, how you doing? Can you go get this? Or whatever that is. How do you guys handle that? And I want to popcorn that out there. Anyone who wants to, uh, that's kind of add on. How do you handle that? What, what do you say something to them? What, what do you do? I definitely say something. Um, that's one thing that I can say is probably good and bad. Uh, of, I guess the strength and a weakness of mine is the inability to not say something when I'm bothered. Um, and that's something that I have encountered many times, many times. Um, just comments or, you know, inappropriate treatment in the middle of a conversation. And I've literally been in, in a meeting and had someone just cut me off and like, like go into what they're, you know, saying. And I may not do it in the public forum. It's not appropriate. And I don't want to be confrontational because I know that means something different for me as a black woman in the industry I work in, but it doesn't go unnoticed or unsaid. And so I have emailed people and said that, you know, I really didn't appreciate the way you addressed me today. And, you know, I would really like if you didn't do it again. And I've also said, I really don't like the fact that what I was saying was so unimportant that you cut me off to say what you had to say because that was more important. So, and I think it, it, I've gotten to a point of that just simply because, I mean, I have gotten older and a little bit more um, confident in where I stand in my career. But then at the same time, I just feel like I have children, I have a husband, and if they're, they can't do that, these people are kind of virtually strangers to me. So why would I allow people that I really have no connection to, to disrespect me in that way? And I just, I don't tolerate it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I would just add, you know, even recently um, on a Facebook page, I had a troll come by and that just made the simple comment of, I would never elect a female, um, never elect a female, you know, and that was a simple enough sexist comment. <laughs> but then, you know, I had a friend chime in, well, why? And then what proceeded was just um, vile comments about women in our role. And I mean, it was disgusting. Um, and what I noticed in, in that um, instance was that I had such a network of friends and supporters and, you know, detractor <laughs> people that, you know, really went against him. Um, and it, it, it buoyed me because, you know, I keep hearing like, you will get kicked around in this world, you know, but if you have that network and those supporters, you really, you'll, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get by, you'll, you'll survive and you will succeed and you'll grow that thick set skin. Um, I also think you teach people how to treat you, you know, so when someone cuts you off, when someone, you know, lessens your point of view or your voice, if you say nothing, you're teaching them that that's okay, you know, and so I think it is so critical that you do say something. I mean, sometimes I go the route where I try to be funny or make a joke or put it, volley it back to them. Um, sometimes you're not in that space where you're joking, you know, or you, you do have to confront it. But also similar to what Candace said, you know, you, you have to pick your battles because sometimes it is the, the forum not to say something publicly, but you do have to address it because I think it would, it'll continue and it'll continue to all of us if we don't, you know, stand up to people that think that's okay, you know, to just interrupt and lessen our voices. So good, Councilwoman. I'm very, very good. And it kind of leads into the question, Dr. Barnes, if you'd like to address this is, what do you do when you have a seat at the table, but your voice is not being heard? It kind of goes towards this comment, right? Because that's why we're here and how to be heard when you get that seat. I want to echo what the other panelists have said. And I would say, um, 
if that thought of doing that fills you with st stress, anxiety, dread, hives, whatever, um, I think here's a, here's a lesson. Um, you can do it later, as has been mentioned, and when you do it, you approach the person not as an enemy, but as someone that you're, you're bringing an issue to. And if you do that right quick, that first time it happens, the first time you notice it, the first time it sinks in and you see it, you say to them, wow, I, this, you said this. For, for me, it was my very first dean when I got a job, so made a sexist joke at the first faculty meeting I went to. I like my meetings like I like my skirts short. Oh my God. So, um, so I said something to him later and he never said a sexist thing the rest of my relationship with him. And he handled it incredibly well. He was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about it. I had just heard that joke the day before and I thought it was funny. You're right. Should I apologize to everyone? You know, like best possible scenario in terms of response could have been worse. But my feeling is you, by calling someone on it, even if it's really difficult, the, the likelihood that you won't have to do it again increases the, 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 the more clearly, dispassionately and appropriately you respond. That's not always the case. I definitely recognize that. Um, so the, the being heard at the table thing beyond that, um, Alice Walker has this, uh, I can't remember what essay it's in, but she says, don't be the only one, never be the only one. <laughs> Uh, and I, especially for women of color, that's really challenging in a lot of spaces. Uh, so I think uh, we could maybe extrapolate it to say, um, find your allies um, and, and build those relationships. Uh, as Candace was saying, you know, um, try to make sure that you're uh, showing up for other people's issues. I feel like uh, I, I have said in other spaces that I'm an aspiring anti-racist ally. You know, I'm, I'm always learning, always aspiring. Uh, but when I show up on issues that are not mine, um, I make friends and I make allies who then also will show up for my issues when, when, I, when called or when asked to do that. So build those relationships, of course, do your work and be prepared. You know, I mean, I think that um, excellence does matter. You know, you could debate if you're looking at the political landscape uh, from, from on the federal level, but, but, but it's true that if you bring good ideas, good energy and ways forward, it, that is important and, and it, it matters. So, so do your work and then, um, get a mentor as has been said uh, or talk to talk to the people who are supposed to be responsible if things are really going badly um, there are people who are supposed to be responsible again i would say it doesn't always work i i know way too many incidences where the hr people are part of the problem and um that uh but if you're in a horrible situation, uh, I think it's really important to remember you don't have to stay in that situation. And if it's not in your organization, there might be somebody outside of your organization who you can also work with the Civil Rights Commission, for example, things like that. There are ways to, to, to not have to live with a horrible situation. Gosh, that got kind of dark. <laughs> that's, a, that's all reality. I think that this is something that we all will experience. If you've been in the work field, if you can, the higher up you go, you're going to be experiencing this. And that's what we need to do. Get that seat at the table. So thank you for telling us to never be the only one. And One thing else I would say that I uh, was thinking about is um, it isn't wrong in a meeting, especially if you're at the table and somebody interrupts you or you're not being heard, to simply note that you're not being heard. And um, I think uh, to say, hey, I, this is, I, I didn't finish, I did not get to finish this. Um, and, you know, I recognize you want to take it somewhere else, Bob, but I, I want to finish this. And I feel like one of the things that I've gotten a little bit better at is uh, also intervening. Like, I mean, literally I was at a meeting, this was a couple of years ago and said, you know that the woman sitting over there just said the idea that you just said, you all heard her say it, didn't you? You know, I'm getting a little bit better at that part. Of yeah. Okay. We can, everybody, can we get some snaps for that? Snap it up. That's right. 
<laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to address something I know folks think about. Yes, um, the chat is on fire. Uh, so <laughs> I want to address something that people think about because that takes some power. It takes what? Because some people are dealing with self-doubt. You know, some people are dealing with fear of being themselves. I think we need to address that because some of us aren't always there. How'd you get there? Let's talk about you, uh, Candace. Talk a little bit about overcoming self-doubt and feelings of fear just to be who you are and just like out like that. Oh, and it's, I still deal with it depending on the environment. And it's like I have two voices. I have the voice that's like, you know, is not the question is not who's going to let me. The question is who's going to stop me, right? But then I have this on this ear like, but really, like, seriously, is that, what are they going to say? How are they going to look at you? Or, or who is going to question, you know, who you think you are to try to jump and just do something like that, even just like applying for jobs. And, you know, when I think about some of the jobs that I've had, literally, um, I have always been like, is this job imposter syndrome, really? I mean, like, I'll just be honest and call it what it is. I've always wondered, do do I deserve to be there or should I be there? And simply because I'm comparing myself to either who was there before, who am I reporting to, um, and how, how do I fit into that box? And, and I started looking at that differently and started to, instead of seeing how I fit in there, is that somewhere that belongs a part of my journey? Like, does that place deserve me? Because I bring a lot to the table. I bring a lot of connections. I bring a lot of education. I bring a lot of experience. I bring a lot of knowledge and instinct, which is critical in this role. So when I started thinking about, does this place, do I belong there? Not because of their circle, but do they deserve to have me as a part of them? Then I started to get a little bit better at self-doubt. Then I, got, I started to be able to be more vocal. And I think that that's something that you can think of wherever you work at. Like, you don't have to be external communications manager for TPS. You could be, do, you know, I've, I'm a really good manager, but does McDonald's deserve my management skills? You know, does this place deserve me? And think of yourself that way as an asset to them and what you as a whole bring to the table, not just what's on your resume. Because sometimes what you have on your resume is just a blink of what all you bring to the organization. So like I said, but I still, every now and then, it's just a couple of things that I think I tell myself to try to um, get over that. So like I said, I talk to myself in my head, not out loud. Well, sometimes out loud. If my kids were here, they'd be like, no, you talk to yourself out loud too. <laughs> but but most, I talk to myself and I remove self-doubt through affirmations to myself because I always have to go back to what I bring to the table. Can we get some more snaps on that? I mean, seriously, because this is reality. Because I think some folks in the chat were like, what? You deal with that, Candace? Every All the time. time. <laughs> Every Everybody. Let's and I'm going to add, I saw it because the, the chat is definitely lit. And somebody yeah, talking lit about like fire. Quote. And I had one quote in uh, Rhonda, who's in there, mentioned Ida B. Wells, who's somebody who I think very highly of, too. Yeah. You know, as she was a journalist, but she also kind of was one, part of the origins of just the PR industry in general. And she said, and this is something that I like to lean on just simply because being a Black woman in my industry, Virtue knows no color line, and the chivalry, which depends on the complexion of skin, can command no respect. Mm, that's awesome. That's Ida B. Well. So Thank it, you. it is, but I think a lot of people who are confident on the outside to get there, you, I mean, it's, maybe it's a lot of people out there to just go in the door knowing, like, I'm the bomb and whatever. I'm not that person. I had to get there. Yeah, I am not either. And that's why I think very highly of positive affirmations, because if we're going to change the political landscape that we started off with, we have got to make certain that we are telling ourselves who we are, obliterating this imposter syndrome, applying for things that we may not fit all the categories, but we're going to go for that. And I believe, Councilwoman, you did that because you're there. 
So can you share, because some folks are looking at this political landscape and going, I don't even know. Thank you, Candace, by the way, that was fire. But Dr. Dr. Uh, Councilwoman Moline, can you share more about the political empowerment on the local level and what do you see because we need to get get there and I, you know i'm sure that some of the things that has been discussed may fit with what you're saying but can you expand upon that for us sure and thank you so much candace on um, you know starting that discussion because i think that is so critical to so many people um, and how you get started how you succeed how you i mean really how you show up every day um i couldn't agree with you more i, I always I always just keep thinking the first step is showing up, right? Being at the table. But then it's also asking the questions. It's continuing to study. You know, you have to be a lifelong learner um, without a doubt. Um, and then you, and another part is demanding recognition too. You know, just to follow up on what you're saying, um, if you do something well, you should be recognized for it. And that's not just part of your daily affirmations. You, you should <laughs> demand to your leadership that, hey, I, I did this and I deserve credit and, you know, and take that credit and own it, right? Um, but as far as the political, you know, political empowerment at a local level, I think what the most important step is to, is just to get involved, right? How do you do that though? I think you join organizations. I, I think in Toledo, we have a plethora of great organizations. One of Toledo obviously is, is one, but um, there's so many groups that I've noticed even in professional, um, settings, you know, I know that Ohio CPAs have a women empowerment group. Our United Way has a women's initiative group, and all of these, all of these groups have positions of power in them, right? So you can gain that experience um, of of becoming a leader. Uh, you, it also helps you become an expert in your field, which I think again lends you that credibility, which then you know you can keep telling yourself that I'm good enough and I deserve to be here. Um, I guess the other the other part would just be um, I think we have to continue to support each other. We have to continue to invest in each other. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm at the very beginning of this political journey that hopefully will continue. <laughs> and, but I have, I'm very committed to helping other women. You know, I've, I've been blessed to have so many strong allies and mentors and leaders, both female and male. I mean, I, I don't want to discredit the men that have, you know, helped me and given me, you know, opportunities. Uh, but having having those, having the example, and then being able to pay it forward, I think, is so critical to political empowerment of women, especially locally. Um, and so, and I think that will help change the attitudes um, about women. And that's again why it's so important to have women at um, in in power, in political power, right? Is that we need to change attitudes. We need to create policies that support women. Um, and that, and you get that by having more women at the table, I believe. So. Is anyone else, Candice, you want to jump in on it? Yeah. I just wanted to jump in on what she said about supporting women. Um, when I talk about who my mentors were, they were all, all women, but some of the people who have given me some of the most defeat has also been women. Um, and so looking at support support could just be if you supervise somebody on your team and you're the director and you have to go present your idea to the the big suits shout that person out and thank you to so and so on my team for helping me put this pre presentation together because what i've learned in leadership and how come i've had much success in that is that your work cannot affect how people feel about me if I do a good job. So when I recognize you and your good work and how it helped me and the team, it makes me look better because I hired you, you're on my team. So looking at it like, this is how I'm gonna support my staff member, even though this person doesn't get to go in that meeting and represent themselves when they present these ideas, that's what I do as the leader to represent that person, to show them, hey, I care about the work you do for me, and here's how I'm going to, to show that to people above me, so that when it's time for me to retire, or me to do my thing, or go to a different job, or whatever I do, you can be next. And that's one of the things, like I said, I've had much success with women being supportive, and I've had much success with women who have not been supportive. And usually, it is because of, feelings of 
feelings that I can't control, feelings of their own challenges. But just hearing, like I said, hearing myself say it out loud, that's the best way you can support other women is just helping them get to the table if they're not there. And if they're not able to get to the table, helping to represent and ch champion for them. Can we get some snaps? Shout other women out. Shout them out. Lift them up publicly. Let them know. Because I know there's one thing that, you know, in the, in the work world, sometimes, I don't know if you've been there, I've been in positions where people have like, not, I've done the work, but no one would say anything that I did the work and they would take the work and own it as their own. It such comes from a secure, powerful place to be able to share with people how they lift you up, right? Snaps on that. You got that right, Becca. All right. So one last question before we get into, let's see if we have one last question. I want to get some audience questions because if you haven't been following the chat, it's blowing up with a lot of books and information. Boy, that alone is its own panel. So, but I want to ask this question. How do you figure out which table you want to see that? Because a lot of people are figuring out, I don't even know, how do I even start? What seat do I need to go to? Dr. Barnes, you want to give us a shout out on that? What you, what you got to say? I'm, I'm going to shout and run because I have class. Yes, you got to go. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Um, <laughs> it's only down the hall, so I'm good. Um, but I got to sanitize first. Yeah. Uh, deciding what table you want to sit at, a couple of things. Um, that question really struck me. It came into the group beforehand, and I wanted to offer a couple of thoughts. First is look around at what needs to be done. There's so much good work to do. Whenever I, One of my mentors says, whenever you hear people complaining about how bad things are, hmm. you know it's a good time to be alive because there's a lot of good work to do. Um, but I would say it, it kind of piggybacking on the discussion about um, taking yourself seriously uh, and believing in yourself is you have to pay attention to yourself. Um, what is it that you, what makes you happy? It's, it's, I mean, I can't tell you what happened when I turned 50 and I went, how did I get here? Uh, you know, you have to be paying attention to the things that are making, uh, making life meaningful and good and hopefully joyful for you. Um, what are you good at? What are you interested in? Uh, those are the things that are going to continue to be rich for you um, in the long haul. And of course, those things, you know, it's one thing to say, I, I, you know, I see that that thing needs to be done and I am totally incompetent, un incapable and uninterested. You know, don't go there. Uh, go to the place where you can make, uh, you can feel that your contribution is going to be meaningful. Um, use the tools that are available. There's, there are so many ways to explore yourself and understand yourself from the cheesy uh, and, you know, uh, not accurate for everybody, those personality sorters, all those things. I tell my students to do that. Um, but I would also say consult your mentors. Uh, interview people in the fields that look interesting to you. Uh, do informational interviews with them. You know, people will tell you. Here's the best thing about my job, and here's the thing that I totally hate. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to figure out uh, how to maximize the skills that you're bringing and um, the difference that you can make. And and really, truly, yeah, what makes you happy? What fuels your soul? You know, like it's hopefully you're going to have a nice long life. But um, I had a mentor one time when I was young say, you know, you're probably going to have about 75 Septembers in your life. Well, so what are, you're going to have uh, 70, 75, 78, maybe 82, uh, August 26th. What do, what do you want to be doing next August 26th that, that's going to make you happy? And you can only know that from where you're standing today. So, so you know, keep exploring, keep growing. Uh, I read this morning, uh, living life is about learning how to live, constantly learning how to live. I totally mangled it, but that was the impression anyway. Uh, great to see all of you and, and see your thoughts and um, have a great rest of your uh, 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. 80 some years of effort went into that. So if, if we think we're easily defeated, they can think again. Not gonna Thank happen. Thank you so Thank much, you Dr. Barnes. And that uppity woman's poetry workshop, we need to know a little bit more about. So maybe- I'll, 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 I'll have to get back to you yes. on that. We, yes. Ever since the feminist bookstore closed, it's, it's been a challenge, but we're, we're there in spirit.
Peace Thank off. you so much for everything. Oh, this is awesome. Great. Amazing. We are at the 1245 hour. Ladies, what y'all think about that? This has been off the charts. Awesome. Candace, Councilwoman Moline, you guys have been amazing. And I want to see, you know, Nina, do we have a question that we want to ask from the chat? I didn't, I wasn't, I haven't been keeping up. By the way, I just want to shout out Lots of great books, lots of great resources. If you haven't been in the chat, you can, of course, copy and paste. And I love what Rhonda said. You can make your own table in your own chair. Go to make your own, sit, put your own chair up to the table. Shirley so, said that. Yeah, Shirley um, I had one thing that yeah. Dr. Barn, she started, and I wanted to just add to that when it was talking about seats to the table, because one of the things that I started early, like on in my professional career was wanting to be at all the tables. Like I wanted to do everything. Somebody asked me, you want to serve on this board? Yep. I'm going to do that. Cause I want to build my network. You want to come help us do this and be on this community? Yep. Cause I want to, I want to build my network and I want to get to know people. And then I would find myself sitting in meetings like, now why did I sign up for this? <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, I should have said no. Like, I just, you know, even now, like, sometimes I'm on some Zooms, like, what did, I should have said no. So say, learn, no is a word, is a sentence. You can just say no and it's cool. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was realize the value of your time. And if nothing has taught us that is quarantine, the, the value of just having some time. And then serve things that matter to you because that, again, when you're just picking up and doing everything, you start to learn. Like, I really, I really don't, I, this is important, but this isn't what I like to support. This isn't passionate. I mean, it's, I'm not passionate about this topic. And then that's what I said. When you work at a place and you go to work at a place, look at their mission and their vision and make sure you support that. Because when you come to an organization, regardless of what your role is, your, responsi your responsibility is your part of helping to deliver that mission and vision. And if that's not who you are or what you want to be a part of, you just shouldn't even apply. Um, and always serve, serve, serve. If you cannot put service before self, no matter how far you get in the corporate or you know nonprofit or whatever ladder you're climbing, you will not have the fulfillment you have you need to have in your heart to serve before self and that serve however you like to serve some people is financial and philanthropic some people is hands-on whatever is for you just make sure at some point in your life you put service before self i just wanted to add those little bits thank you so okay i'll go back on mute <laughs> can, I, can i jump in when you said be careful how you join an organization i always hear this quote that says when you say yes to something you're saying no to something else and always and that really goes into that value, you know, the value of your time, you know, and putting your best energy out there. I also keep thinking um, about what uh, Rhonda Sewell said, which I love that, you know, build your own table. It coincides with a, a thought I keep having that Speaker Pelosi said. She made a, you know, she said a quote of something, no one will give you, you know, no one will give you power. You have to go take it. And I think that should buoy people and motivate, you know, motivate us to just go for it and go take it, you know, not to be nice women that just expect if we're nice, we'll get what we want. Um, and then again, I think I saw it in the chat too, and it was a point I wanted to make. Um, the seat at the table is so important, but the voice, having a voice at the table, you know, and I think we've really expanded on that already, but just wanted to emphasize that. Um, how, how critical that is. And I'm just so proud to be here and I'm proud of everyone that's participated. And I'm just, I'm just so honored to be, to be here on the 100th anniversary of, of the right to vote. Uh, this is Thank you. amazing. Can we all give a round of applause for Councilwoman Moline, Candace Harrison, of course, Dr. Barnes. And I just want to wrap us up because we're at the 1250 hour and I don't, I, I want to be value your time <laughs> as we've talked about. I want to just give a few wrap up points. First of all, we've seen that communication, the CPA field and politics, there's lots of work to be done and that the tipping point for influence is 25%. Check around, look around and see where you're at. Acknowledge your history, you know, and humility, perseverance is important. Value mentors. Don't, br don't burn the bridge even when you're upset, but say what you need to say. Use your voice. Find networks to support. Always serve. Approach people. Say something. Never be the only one. Build relationships. You don't have to stay, you, you don't have to stay where you are. Look around and maybe you might see something else. 
listen, uh, try to kick the imposter syndrome to the side, utilize affirmations, pay attention to yourself, see how you are responding to things, consult your members, demand recognition, get involved, join organizations, support one another, shout other women out, right? And value your time. And lastly, be nasty. <laughs> be nasty. And instead, not just having a seat at the table, having a voice at the table. So thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for everyone in the chat who's been so amazing and providing such great information. We'll turn it over to you, Nani.